right, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to uh, San Francisco Big Analytics, and uh, welcome to GoPro. So uh, my name is Chester Chen. I'm the uh, head of engineering, data science and engineering at GoPro, as well as the organizer for the meetup. So uh, tonight we're going to uh, mainly the GoPro teams to talk about the, our data pipelines and uh, analytics. So um, before I introduce the speakers, uh, I'd like to pass the mic to uh, the senior director of cloud engineering at GoPro to talk about GoPro. It's a session. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Cedric Canales, and I'm responsible for cloud engineering at GoPro. So welcome to GoPro. Um, let's see a show of hands. How many of you here own GoPro cameras? All right, awesome. Before the night's over, Chester's going to get at least another two of you hooked onto GoPro. <laughs> so hang loose, stay here a bit, and we'll, we'll have some drawings later on. Uh, there are a few cameras we're giving away. Wow. Um, but again, welcome. We've, uh, this is the first time we're actually doing one of these tech meetups here in, in the San Mateo office. If any of you have attended uh, Chester's meetups before, we've uh, done them in San Francisco. And they were very well attended, and I'm glad to see we've got a decent uh, attendance here as well. So thanks for coming out. Um, really love having you guys here. Um, as far as GoPro is concerned, you guys might know GoPro really as uh, a camera manufacturer. We built some of the world's best cameras. Um, we've also released a drone, as you might know, called Karma, which is doing very well. But we're also big on software, and a lot of the stuff we do uh, is very tightly integrated in this ecosystem between hardware and, and software. And that's important to us. And a lot of what we'll be talking about here today um, on the big data side um, ties all of that together. So our software feeds big data, our hardware feeds big data, and that helps us get a lot of business intelligence and helps us make decisions about building better products and building better services for our consumers. Um, so with that, I'll hand off to, to Chester and David here. Um, one last thing before I go. We are hiring. Um, we've got a bunch of openings. Uh, on the big data side, on the analytics side, um, camera firmware team could use some help. If you guys are friends that uh, build firmware for hardware products, we'd love to talk to them. And on the cloud engineering front as well, we've got some openings on uh, for some of our microservices on the back end. So any of you guys in that space are interested, we're out here, come hang out with us, and uh, I'd love to catch up with you guys. So thanks, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, our first, we have two talks tonight. Uh, so the first talk is about the data platform, data engineering. So uh, our first speaker, uh, the first talk is given by the two speakers. Uh, one is uh, David Winters, who is the architect at uh, uh, the GoPro's uh, data science and engineering teams. And then uh, the other speaker is Hao, Hao Zhou. Uh, uh, he's also the, uh, the part of the team. And David has been, in a, I don't know if you have a slide for uh, introduce yourself or not. Yeah, so, uh, so Dave, Dave has a 20 years of experience in building um, uh, data warehousing, databases related to big data, and I've been spent two years building our streaming pipelines. And how is a software engineer in our team, and uh, previous that has done uh, Hadoop, different type of Hadoop from Cloudera, Hortonworks, you know, MapR, you know, you name it. Uh, in the last company's uh, in a machine learning company and also has the pivotal. So uh, with that, you know, so, thanks. Thanks, thanks Adam. I'll go ahead and get us started. And, and yes, I did get that picture taken at the mall. It's a place called Glamour Shot, so you do a great <laughs> job. Um, again, I'm, I'm Dave Winters, um, the, the big data architect within the data science and engineering team here at GoPro. Um, and yeah, we'll be talking about um, basically our data platform and then how it's going to actually take us into a deeper dive of something we call dynamic DDL, which is um, a feature of our data platform, which basically allows us to add structure to the data as it's being streamed to us and quickly turn it around so that our analysts can actually gain insights from the data quickly. So with that, I'll go ahead and, uh, and just jump in here. Um, we're going we're to, before we go technical, um, I'll start and just do some background, just give you an idea of what kind of data we're dealing with at GoPro and then just a little bit about the, the business. Um, so when we got here, which was basically the data platform started about three years ago here, and GoPro is um, about 13, 14 years old, plus or minus a year or so there. 
And, and when it started, it was basically, it, it was Nick Woodman, who's our founder and CEO. Um, the story goes that he took a digital SLR camera, he wanted to capture uh, his surfing. Uh, he's gonna go on a surf trip in Mexico. Literally stuck it in a Ziploc bag, went surfing, took some pictures, had some ideas, and then just couldn't stop. He just started developing this camera and built prototypes. And after that, what happened was we basically started what we call our GoPro Sponsored Athlete Program, which I, I have no idea how many athletes we have. I wouldn't be surprised if it's 100 or so, but they're you know, extreme sports people, mountain bikers, snowboarders, you know, wakeboarders, skiers, you know, the skydivers, but then there's even traditional sports people, um, uh, PGA golfers uh, today, um, NHL players, NFL football players. And what they would do is they'd take the cameras, they'd beat the heck out of them, they learn what worked, or they learn what didn't work, and they that would really drive the camera. And that probably got us for our first billion or so dollars in revenue. But today, our business is very different. Um, it's much larger, there's many different camera models. We have a drone now, you have controllers that are very sophisticated, and you know have a, a very sophisticated um, a computer essentially inside of those. You have um, the, the Omni rig, where you have like six different cameras. Um, we've got the Karmic Rift, um, we've got a ton of accessories, and a lot of those are very intelligent and actually communicate with the camera. And then, as Cedric mentioned, um, kind of a little uh, known secret side of a lot of times at uh, GoPro, we're a huge uh, software house. Um, we develop mobile applications, we develop desktop applications that allow you to both capture those videos and those images, but also to edit those and to share them on various social networks. We have the GoPro Plus Cloud, which allows you to very quickly offload all of the, the media on your devices, again, put it on, on the web, do quick edits and share it. And so all of these um, you know, products, you, you, you just you can't really do it just by gut anymore. It gets a lot more sophisticated than that. And so what you really need is you need to be able to make quantitative decisions, decisions you need in analytics, essentially. And so this is kind of my cartoon uh, architecture picture here, but basically it shows what, what we were tasked to build with, you know, starting uh, three years ago was build a data analytics platform. Um, we needed to get the input from all the devices that we sell, the, the drones and the cameras today. Um, we also needed to deal with all the social media. GoPro is a huge brand on the, on the various social networks because it's number two on YouTube. Um, and then we have, uh, for those that don't follow the, the, the industry trade, the OTT apps, which is over, what they call it, over the top, stands for basically anything um, that is on your smart TV, you have all these apps. Anything related to like a streaming device, um, GoPro has apps on those. And so we, we needed all of that data. They, of course, provide analytics data. Um, you, of course, have software applications that we, do, we develop on the bottom there, GoPro Plus, our cloud, and our, our Quick and our capture apps. And then you're dealing with all the third-party data, um, all the classic stuff. You have the CRM, the ERP systems, the Google Analytics, the mobile analytics. Um, those where you're really mercy at how often do they provide you the data. Usually it's just once a day, maybe it's an hour or something like that. And so you bring all that into your data platform. You've got to join it all together. You've got to, get to figure out ways to, to you know, join it together. And then ultimately, what do you want? You want the product insights. So you get the visualizations. Um, Tableau is, is one of the big biz tools here. Plotly, those sorts of things. Um, and then you want to do the things that the marketers want to do. You want to do the user segmentation, um, the CRM marketing, the, the push emails, or the push notifications on mobile devices. And so once we, you know, we kind of figured out what we needed to build, the next thing was what were the challenges we had to deal, uh, deal with. And that's the challenges that, that we're going to actually talk about that we solved essentially in building this platform. So the first one that we deal with, we deal with this one every day, is really the variety of data. So it comes from a variety of different products. So obviously we have hardware and we have software here. Um, our software applications um, usually are pretty flexible, right? And so we can use um, standard data formats, we use JSON and those sorts of things. We can gzip them to make it easy to transport the files. The hardware is a bit harder because you're dealing with very limited memory resources, very limited processing power, very limited storage. And so we often use binary proprietary formats to really pack the data in tight, makes our job a little harder. The external systems are always challenging because we don't control those. We don't control how often Google Analytics gives us data or Salesforce or if it's NetSuite or you know, whatever you know, the application you choose for those uh, systems, um, you really have their, their mercy, the format, and then the schedule. Um, the other challenge is, is, is really there's um, the way you ingest the data. So we talked about the formats, the next is how you ingest it. 
we personally prefer within our data platform to deal with streaming data. But the nice thing with streaming uh, data is that we kind of think of it as risk mitigation. Instead of waiting 24 hours until some provider can give you some data, or even if you're patching it up yourself, you have this constant stream of data. And so you can kind of figure out like, you know, what's our normal load here? Okay, let's take a look at trends. Okay, maybe we need to add a few servers even during the day if you have elasticity. You can save a lot of money that way. With the batch stuff, it can be a lot harder because a lot of times you can't really quite figure out how much data you're going to have until you suddenly get this giant amount of data and it takes too long to catch up. So we deal with both of those. Internally, we do a lot of streaming. Externally, of course, it's still batch for most of these third parties. And then you deal with just the complex transformations. Um, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the proprietary binary pack data that we have to deal with, um, all the different formats, um, you know, every acronym you can think of under the sun, JSON, XML, CSV, you name it. Um, and then finally, we have to seamlessly bring all that stuff together. So to figure out how do we join all these data sources, how do we deal with event um, data versus state-based data. And, and we'll get into all of this in, in just a little bit. Then the last one, which is um, at the very bottom of the screen, some people probably can't even see it, it actually should be at the top of the screen, is handling privacy and anonymization. And obviously that's on the top of mind of a lot of people these days with anything related to analytics and those sorts of things. Like what do you do with PII? And PII and all of the laws and regulations throughout the world are constantly changing. And we've taken a, a very, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 I just say PII forward stance with that and work with attorneys a lot on you know, what it is we want to do there. So with all that said, we're going to go technical here. Um, so I just want to kind of get that out of the way, kind of set the, the stage here. So what I want to first talk about is basically we're going to talk about the evolution of our, our, our data architecture, our data pipeline. This is actually our, our 2.0 version. Um, our dynamic DDL is our 3.0 version. Um, this is what uh, you know, I'll, I will, um, I guess, colloquially refer to as our old file-based uh, pipeline architecture here. Um, so what you, what you want to notice is a few things. Um, we do basically three main um, uh, workloads within this data platform. It's very common for most data platforms. You've got to ingest the data. You've got to do some transformations. Then you've got to deliver the data. I mean, you've got to allow people to do analytics. On the upper left-hand corner, you'll see our real-time cluster. So that's how we manage all our streaming um, uh, sources. Those are going to all come from GoPro devices generally, and then GoPro software that we have. So we can actually control that. Um, what we use is we use a combination of basically um, a RESTful service in the front end to post all of these anonymized logs to. Um, we, we use Tomcat for that. Um, we have a nice pool of those, and it's elastic because everything is running in AWS. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into all these, um, each one of these bubbles as we go through these slides here. Um, we use Kafka, which actually works very well for us, especially with the logs. Um, it's, it's made for essentially log processing that way. Um, Spark Streaming, which pairs very nicely with Kafka, um, has built-in adapters, um, exactly once processing uh, transactional semantics, which is really nice. And it's nice because we can use Spark, and you'll see this throughout our architecture, we can use Spark everywhere from ingestion, to ETL and then finally to the actual uh, delivery of the actual analytical queries. And then we use a lot of HBase also, which works out well for our event data because you get all these events, like you know, certain events are happening maybe with a camera or with a GoPro application, but what you really want is you want the state at some point. You want to know like, what was the state of that, that device at that time. And so HBase looks really great for that one. Um, after we've after we, you know, received the, the logs and then they come in a variety of different formats, it could be that proprietary packed binary format that can be in JSON, that can be in a, a, a GZIP um, CSV format. We've normalized everything into a, um, a JSON format. Um, those essentially will collect from anywhere from 30 minutes to 12 hours, depending on the data source within the real time cluster. And then the ETL cluster actually gets a, a copy of it. Now, the ETL cluster is where we kind of pull out a little bit more old school Hadoop uses a lot of Hive. We, have, we do use some Spark. It's been, um, uh, been uh, I'd say, actually rapidly moving over to Spark. Um, uh, this is basically the, the functions you have to do here is you have to um, uh, join the data sources. Um, so we've got all these disparate data sources. We're going to bring those together. And you want to aggregate them, right? Because generally speaking, um, if you're looking at event data, um, billions and billions of events per day, you, you're going to need to aggregate that if you want to be able to do analytical queries in a reasonable amount of time. And then the most important step, actually, is, is changing the, uh, the format of it. Um, 
you know, JSON is a great format for the transfer of data. It's a horrible format if you're dealing with big data. I've always said you want to make big data, make it really big data. Usually there's another word in the middle there. Um, just put it in JSON. It just really bloats it out. So we actually use um, a columnar data format called Parquet. Um, use GZIP compression. Um, get about 100x times smaller just with that simple conversion. So all of that is, is mostly written in Hive. Use Airflow, which is what controls those batch jobs. Um, and like I was saying, the ETL cluster can run anywhere from jobs from about every 30 minutes to about uh, once every 12 hours. On the, on the real-time cluster, you're looking at batch durations of anywhere from about two seconds to um, I think the slowest one's about least five minutes. So it starts to slow down, as you can see, as you hit this ETL cluster. Um, the next step is um, getting into the secure data mark. So um, in order to, to get it, the, the actual data delivered to the analytics <coughs> apps here, which um, definitely GoPro Tableau is a very popular dashboard app. Um, there's other folks who are using Plotly, um, Q, if you just want to do interactive analysis, and there's a lot of just Google Python code. If you want to get the data to the analytics apps, you really don't want to use something like Hive. It's just going to take too long. And so we have to use Impala here. Um, you know, it's basically, the nice thing with Impala is it's essentially, you can think of it as their, their SQL is a superset of HiveQL. Um, they have some additional UDFs that they add to it, but it's, it, you know, it's, it, if you're using one, you can use the other, and so it works well for us. Um, it's in memory, so it's gonna be, you know, anywhere from 10 to 100 times faster than if you're using Hive. Um, we use the same Parquet files that we created on the ETL cluster. And then the real key was basically the security. And so we use Apache Sentry for that which allows you to have access control lists that you basically pull out of Active Directory. We use Kerberos for authentication. Cold chill goes down my back because I say Kerberos. It's if anyone has dealt with Kerberos, it's not fun. Um, and, and, that's, and, and that's pretty much it for the three main functions. Um, the other thing to kind of bring into the picture here too is we do have to deal with batch. You always have to. You're always gonna have those external third party sources and the data may not be available, but if you're lucky, possibly hourly. Um, realistically, a lot of these data sources, like a Google Analytics, is once every 24 hours. And in those cases, we go through our batch induction framework. And that, that's a homebrew, you know, home-built um, job application that we've written. Um, we can essentially configure the download jobs as long as they have a RESTful API or some sort of an FTP download or an S3 synchronization. Um, we can automatically schedule those to download. And then same kind of thing, they get dumped into the ETL cluster. And then when we do our ETL, we can bring in, say it's Google Analytics or Local Analytics, we can join that into our, our um, internal uh, data sources from the devices and the applications. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a little bit, just a deeper dive here into those, those three you know, main clusters that we talked about there. So basically, this is our streaming endpoint where we start to ingest the data. So as you can imagine, the, the logs you see there on the left, which are being posted via HTTP, those are going to be logs that are coming from our devices and from our, our um, software apps that our end users, that the actual customers are using. Um, they come in a variety of formats, again, proprietary, proprietary packs, uh, binary versions, GZIP, JSON files, just raw JSON. Some of them are batched up on devices, some are rapid fire and you know, sent to us, just really depends on the application. Um, we're 100% AWS, so um, everything's running in EC2. We've got an ELB, if you're familiar with AWS, it's an elastic load balancer. Basically, it's a virtualized load balancer that you can give it an image of your machine, they call it an AMI, with an AWS speak, and it can just dynamically scale up your Tomcat servers for you in this case. We just have some custom Java servers that we use. Pretty simple, basically do some authentication, make sure that we know who's sending us the data, make sure it's, it's valid, and then we stick it into Kafka immediately. Um, Kafka is really great for us again. Um, uh, fantastic throughput. Um, three or four commodity uh, servers, you get a million writes per second. Um, very, very cheap hardware, very reliable. A little tough to administer, but once you get it set up, it works great. Works fantastic for log data. Our logs um, can vary greatly in size. They can go up to about a megabyte or so. Oftentimes they're just a few K. Kafka can handle that pretty well. Um, what we do after, once we get into Kafka, what happens is we kick off this pipeline of Spark streaming jobs. I'm gonna, in the next slide, I'll go a little bit deeper into it, but basically we have this kind of stream, or I shouldn't say stream, I'm gonna reuse that word, but this tree of Spark streaming jobs that basically process the logs, um, essentially take them from 
a, a, a unnormalized format and get it into like a flattened, nice normalized format for us at the end there. And then we write those into um, HDFS. It's gonna be event data at that point. So we do double writes here. Um, essentially the, the raw events are gonna get rid of the HDFS here on the right. But at the same time, we start to accumulate the state. So what we wanna know is if a various action happened on a camera, maybe a button press or something, we want to understand like, what state was the camera in at that point. And so we can use HBase for that. HBase is, is a really wonderful way to play those sorts of things because it essentially has this third dimension. It's not like your traditional, like a traditional relational database. Um, it actually has a, a time dimension to it. And so that makes it really easy for us to essentially flatten things out, take this event data, and basically do a pivot. Um, and be able to create the state. So we can create the state of a user profile, state of a camera, and the state of the device, which works out really well for us. And then of course at the end, um, you've got state data in HBase, you've got event data sitting here in HDFS, and just a, a, a flattened, normalized JSON format, and it's ready to go for the ETL, and that kicks off anywhere from every 30 minutes to every 12 hours. So this is um, going just a little bit deeper into you, if you remember there was that little circular kind of diagram there between Kafka and Spark streaming going back and forth. So this is what's, what's really happening. I have this tree-like structure of Spark streaming jobs. And essentially each one of them is, is very reusable. Um, one, the, the very rootmost one is all about the PII. So the first thing we do is we want to make sure that we're abiding by all of our PII rules. So if the rule is to remove data, if it's to anonymize it by, via hashing or encryption, it takes care of that from the very beginning. And then we start to split it off into data categories. It could be data category based on the type of data it is. Um, there's a lot of different rules. Um, the thing that, that uh, where things get very interesting is actually that very last row of the Spark streaming jobs you see right there in front of um, the blue, um, the blue uh, you know, rectangle there. And, and what those jobs do is that's where everything slows down. All of the, the Spark streaming jobs prior to that, they're running about every two seconds. So they're running at reasonably fast. At that point, we slow things down. And we do that because we basically have an impedance mismatch at this point. What we have is Kafka loves little messages. Anywhere from you know, about 1K is its, its sweet spot. It'll go up to a megabyte or so. But once you get down to the, the HDFS, you want big blocks. I mean, 28 megabyte blocks, really like a one gig file or larger. So we slow things down, usually anywhere from one to five minutes or so, you know, depending on the data source. And we start to compact or collect the data. When we have enough data, then we'll start to write nice large um, files out to the disk. And then at the same time, we're updating the, the state in each phase. But again, we're, we're, we end up at the same point. We're ready to go now. We've got the state data in each phase. We've got the event data in HDFS and JSON, and we're ready for the ETL process here. So here's what the ETL um, cluster looks a little bit more like in, internally. We've got the JSON data coming in from the real-time cluster. You got HBase over here in the upper right-hand corner for state data. And then of course we have our batch induction framework, which is again, those are just scheduled jobs that basically is downloading data from third-party data sources and it's dropping it in HDFS, whatever schedule it's on, usually once a day, maybe possibly once an hour. We've got the Hive which kicks in. The Hive is gonna go in there, it's gonna basically do three steps here. Um, it's going to join together various data sources that will pre-join together. We like to build nice big denormalized tables, uh, wide tables, so it's easier for our, our data scientists. They don't have to do lots of joins. So we do the, the joins there. We do pre-aggregations, especially for event data, which is that when some of the signals of various devices can be hundreds of times per second. We'll aggregate that up um, so that the analysts generally don't care about that to be pre-aggregated for them. And then the, the final and last step is we put into a compressed columnar format, gzipped parquet files. And at that point, it's ready to go to the STM cluster. The STM cluster, which is, again, yeah, that's our secure data mark. Um, that means it's all about delivering the data to our analysts. That job can kick off anywhere from every 30 minutes and also once again every 12 hours or so, depending on the data source. Things get simpler as we go kind of from that left of that big architecture diagram, if you remember, to the right. Uh, the streaming stuff, you know, is a little bit more complicated and the ETL gets a little simpler. And then finally the data delivery, it's, it's a lot simpler. At this point we're copying over um, the compressed uh, parquet files. We're adding records to the, or excuse me, partitions to the Hive Metastore so that there's new partitions available for those analytical tables. And then we allow our applications such as Tableau, 
cube could be a straight up Python access that data via ODBC. Um, and then, of course, you can do all of the stuff that the analysts do. They can create Tableau um, server extracts, um, dashboards, you know, all of those things. The, the key thing is, is the Apache Sentry, which is the open source project that we use to create access control lists so that we can use Active Directory and LDAP and basically restrict what analysts can see what. So we make sure that they're only seeing the data that they're allowed to see. So, Definitely a lot of pros in this, a lot of good things. Um, isolation workloads, separate ingest from ETL, and uh, separate that from our delivery, the actual analytics, which is a lot better. Our 1.0 uh, architecture is one big cluster, and that was a seriously a cluster, because somebody come in, fire off a big query, guess what happens, your ingestion, your data ingestion does. So we did a really nice job with that, separated that, fast ingestion by adding Kafka, uh, very reliable, it's very secure because of Apache Sentry, um, fast delivery with the in-memory Impala um, SQL execution engine, and then the loosely coupled clusters, which is really nice. So, uh, especially with Kafka, you can take your real-time cluster totally out of service, you can upgrade it, um, put it back in service, and just, you just start over where, where you left off. Um, same thing, you could bring down the ATL cluster, let data just fill up on HDFS on the real-time cluster for a while, when you're done with your maintenance, put ETL back in, just copies the data over and just catches up. So really nice little uh, couple of clusters uh, that we have there. Challenges though, multiple copies of data. A lot of times with three copies of data. You got it on the real-time streaming cluster, you got it on the ETL cluster, and then you got it on your delivery cluster. Uh, tightly coupled storage and compute. If the ETL is like running out of steam, if, oh, we need more compute, you add another node, but we really don't need more storage, but oh, I've got to put how many terabytes of extra disk, because that's what each, you want to keep homogeneous nodes. Same thing if it goes the other way. You're running out of disk. Oh boy, we've already filled up all 10 disks. Well, I guess we've got to add another node. Well, we don't even need more processing power, or you're going to pay for it anyways. Um, lack of elasticity takes several days. HDFS does if you have to add a new node. Under replicated blocks, um, got to remove a node. Wait another two or three days under replicated blocks. Definitely not fun stuff. Um, then, then, then just the operational overhead of maintaining three static clusters, 24 by 7. So, you know, when we looked at those cons, this is where we came up with the new dynamic TDL architecture, which is what we have today. Um, we, have, we actually have um, both running in production right now. We're currently in the process of cutting over to the new dynamic TDL architecture. It just depends on, we're doing it in data source, you know, several data sources at a time. But the advantages that we get here it's the only animation I did in my slides, but I'm really proud of that. It took me about 30 minutes to talk to my wife, but I figured it out. Um, so the, the biggest changes you'll see here, you still see real-time cluster, which is for our ingestion, data ingestion. You still see the ETL cluster. Hmm, now you see multiple data marks. So but the difference is that in the real-time cluster now, we're no longer writing to HDFS. We're writing in all to S3 now. So we have one copy of the data. We have one Hive Metastore, which we had three previously. The Hive Metastore is what adds the structure to the files. So we're just one central repository. The batch induction framework in the lower left-hand corner also does the same thing now. We write directly to S3, add the structure as the data comes in. Um, and then at the top there, the ephemeral ETL cluster, you'll notice that it's ephemeral now. So actually, if it's not being used, you know, we actually don't even need it. So you, you can kick off some jobs, every 30 minutes. That job that ran once every 12 hours, you don't need it until you need it, until so you, you just spin it up. Um, same thing for the data mark clusters. Previously, we just couldn't keep our analysts happy, but whatever we did, like, oh, hey, we added more nodes. They'd, somebody run a query, and go, oh, it's, it's really running slow. And uh, be like, oh, but we just added like all these nodes, and, and you have to add more nodes, and then you have this huge cluster, and then we get complaints like, look at the AWS bill. You have all these nodes that are just sitting there not being used. It's like, yeah, but we need it for quarter end. And it, was just, it was just very difficult. So now we actually have multiple clusters. Um, and then there's elasticity within the cluster itself. You can actually, because we've separated the storage from the compute. Um, so definitely helped a lot more. And then the final one is we only have one uh, cluster that we have to maintain as far as 24 by 7 now. And that's the real time cluster. So it's the only one that's not ephemeral. So definitely. A lot of improvements there. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Hal. Hal's going to go deeper, go into some code, as I believe, and talk about our, our dynamic TDL and how we did it.
Thank you. Thank you, David. So my name is Hao. So it's H A O, not H O W. So, so I'm going to dig down into the dynamic detail. So I'm going to show you a little, to show you guys some snippet of code of how we implement our dynamic detail. So. Before I jump into the actual code, I will uh, re let's review this architecture of our streaming cluster. So, so we still have the load balancer of several Tomcat that comes into Kafka. So it will uh, distribute several uh, Kafka topics. So for each topic, what we did is uh, we dynamically add the table structure and we create the table. Uh, or we insert the data into the table if the table already exists. So we will uh, alter the table when we inject the data. So that's why we call it dynamically. So it will automatically uh, alter the table when we ingest the data. So at this point, you probably wondered, OK, what is dynamic data? So and uh, why we need dynamic data? And how we did this? So dynamic data, we can think about it. So it's nothing but is adding the structure of the data on the fly when we ingest it no matter uh, when the data provider are changing the incoming data structure or not. So the reason we, are, we need this is because we are not the data provider. So David already mentioned that, so we, we, we don't have a control of our data. So our data <coughs> provider constantly changing their data structures. So when they change the data structure, what we have to do is we have to manually update our table structure, update our table, uh, table schema. And we have a tons of aggregation and, and SQL script to uh, to aggregate the table. Then since the uh, data provider changing the table structure, we have to update the aggregation table, uh, aggregation SQL manually. So it will take some, some guys some uh, several hours to finish this boring job, and uh, uh, which means it will take several hours to finish the ingestion when the data provider changing the data structure. So we want to uh, ingest our data in, within minutes. So that's why we came up uh, came up this idea of dynamic DDL. So we want to alter the table structure when we ingest the data. So before we actually uh, get the concept of dynamic DDL, we have a think about like a fixed schema. So which is our 2.0 version. We have a 3.0 version now, which is actual dynamic DDL. But our 2.0 version is uh, using the fixed schema. So I will show you guys an example of how they uh, like a revolutionary come to this uh, dynamic video. So uh, suppose we have this input incoming data. So it has a record. Uh, for, for the record, it has ID, first name, last name, state, and state. So our, uh, what, so we, we for, what we used to do is we flatten the data first. We flatten the data into something like this. So this data will come into for entry. So we will use fixed K, which is record K, record value as a fixed schema K. And so for the each K, it will have the actual attribute, which is the first name, last name, CK, uh, and the state. And the actual value is record value. So, so this, this incoming data will come into the table like this. So this, this, is, this is what we use to have the table. Uh, for each entry, we will have like a uh, four entry of the data. So when the data provider uh, change the data structure, they, they add a new attribute. This, will, this, this table will become five entries. That actually solves the problem of, uh, of data provider changing the data structure constantly. But uh, it's, uh, like, uh, it brings some other problem for the, for the data scientists. So they have to it's a, think about that. If they want to uh, uh, investigate uh, a single event. So they have to grab some SQL like this. This, uh, this aggregation SQL will basically transfer and pivot this table into a single entry table using the actual attribute name as a column name. So basically they don't want to do this. So th that will make, make the, them, them that very hard to, to, uh, uh, to pivot the table into something like that. So that's why we came out this dynamic DDL. So we directly uh, generate the schema based on the attribute uh, name. We use the attribute name as the actual column name to generate the table like this. So 
In the next slide, I will show you guys some uh, our code when the uh, data provider changing the data structure, how we uh, dynamically add the new column or delete some column when they change the structure. So this is some snippet of code. So the first, uh, the first, uh, uh, the first line is adding the partition columns. So it has nothing to do with the uh, dynamic idea, but. Uh, just want to show you guys, it's, it's always better to add partition column to your data, especially when your data is pretty large. You really want to scale down your data when it can run the spark job, because uh, the spark job task is based on the partition, how many partitions you have. Basically, if you have a two partition, then when you run the spark job, you will have two uh, spark uh, job tasks. So you really want to scale down your job. So next, we create a table uh, manually using the using some SQL here. So basically, the, if the incoming data, we use the incoming data attribute name as a actual column name. Uh, so the reason we manually create the table is because uh, there is a bug in Spark. So if we let the Spark data frame automatically create the table, so the, at the end, the, uh, the, uh, the schema in the table will get out of sync with the how many stuff. So they have a Jira ticket to take care of that. I'm not sure when they going to resolve this problem. But uh, before they resolve the problem, we have to create a table manually. So then, so suppose, some, suppose the data provider changing their data structure, they add, some, they add some new attribute into their incoming data. So what we did is uh, we add this new, we found which column are missing in, uh, what is the new column in, in the incoming data? So basically we use a filter uh, with, uh, so to our existing table. So we find the table that not exist in the incoming data, uh, not exist in the uh, existing table, but uh, uh, exist in the incoming data. Then we alter the table, we add a new column to our existing table. So here we are using an uh, alter table syntax here. Uh, we are using really old version of Spark. We are using 1.5, so this after table syntax works for us. But if you guys are using Spark 2.0, so we try to upgrade our uh, Spark version to 2.0, so they no longer support after table syntax. You have to basically using the data frame API to uh, alter the table to add a new column. Um, so after we add the table, here's the most important thing. So they have to be out, you have to reorder the uh, the columns in the incoming data to match the order of the uh, of the structure in the destination table. If you do not, if you don't reorder your data when you append data into your destination table, the Spark will use the position based uh, position based uh, concept to append your data. Basically, your column name will not be uh, it will not follow the column name. It will just follow the position. So you have to reorder your incoming data to match the destination table to make sure they are in the same in the same position for the column. Then next, you just apply the data into the destination table. Here we are using coalesce. Uh, we want to control the partition because uh, with our partition K, we have so many partitions. So if we we do not use the coalesce to control the partition we will have some problem like uh, too many open files open. So our system has really limited resources. Okay, so now we have the table. So we have, a, so no matter the uh, data provider are changing their structure or not, we can, our, this, this part, this uh, amount of code can handle all the, all the incoming data. But in our situation, we have a, uh, so we are using process date and process hour as our partition K. So we basically, we keep this code running for about half a year, then we, we found, okay, our partition K is not correct. The process date and the process hour is uh, a, the task, uh, the time zone for that is, uh, is PST, but the ingested data uh, time zone is uh, UTC. So we should use, so we realized that we should use the ingested date uh, as the partition K and the, as the partition K. So we have to, basically we have to repartition our data. I just want to show you guys some, some tuning tips when repartition uh, a really a large amount of data. So what you guys should do when repartition that. Uh, 
So first, okay, there are some tips here. So choose the partition key wisely. This is really important. So if you are not choosing the partition key wisely, you will basically, so for some partition key, uh, if your data not partition really, really well, when you run the Spark job, basically the Spark, for each Spark job task, it will have a, so, so a, a, lot, a, a large amount of data. So it will throw some error like uh, running out of memory if your uh, cluster is not big enough. Uh, in our case, we are using two partition key, which is uh, the ingest data and the ingest error. So our data is uh, really uh, is uh, even a distributed. So for each you know, for each job task, it only has uh, like a little amount of data. So it won't throw some error like uh, running out of memory. So, but if you are if you have uh, too many partitions, then there will be another problem like uh, what I said. So you will face some problem like uh, too many files open problem. So you really want to use some coalesce to control your job, job tasks. So basically, what you have to do, you have to choose the number uh, based on your data. So that is basically experience thing. So you have to uh, change the coalesce number several times to match your uh, requirement. Then you can insert the insert your uh, you can repartition the data within the uh, cluster. So. Then we, we will have the new repartition data, so then everything everything is it work. So the analytics can use the new partition key to, uh, to run in their query. So this is uh, what we have today. So for the new dynamic PDF, and, uh, and do we, we have uh, do we have any more time? If we have any more time, we can I can ask David to talk about some something the cloud based service. If we don't have a if we don't have time, we can, okay, we're good. Okay. So, okay, so that you wanna talk about here. Yeah. So one of the, the keys to the whole uh, dynamic PDL uh, strategy, and basically the, the third main version of our data platform was uh, getting all the data out of H2Fest for us. Um, we just spent a lot of time managing H2Fest clusters. And, and the fact that we ended up with like three copies of data and, and constantly having to reconcile that. And so what we decided to do is we actually stored in S3, which is, you know, it's a commercial product from, from uh, Amazon. It's really kind of becoming a like, standard for a lot of folks these days, which makes a lot of sense, because it just makes it really easy to access the data from so many of these you know, various, I was calling data services, because there's so many of them out there these days. Um, so a couple things, and these are just things that we learned, that honestly we used S3 before, but not to this degree, where we're streaming large amounts of data in. And so what we learned, and rule number one I always tell people who are like, hey, you know, we're thinking about storing data in S3, I mean, have you used it much before? No, no, we've used HTFS. First thing I always tell people is S3 is not a file system. Which kind of blew my mind. I said, no, what are you talking about? There's this really nice GUI, and you go to the web, their AWS console, it's got directories and stuff, and they're like, no, it's not a file system. It's really an object store. And what they mean by that is it's, it's basically a key value store. It's similar, much more similar to key, a key value store than it is a file system. And so the things where it'll, it'll really get you is just the way that you store an object. Um, you do give it a path, but that, that path is only used to generate a key, essentially, for where that S3 object is stored. Um, about the first three to four characters of that path are used to determine the shard within the bucket. So that's how they get their scalability is they basically shard all the data. So and it's something we'll get to a little later, but um, that's one advanced technique you can do. We don't actually have to take advantage of it, but if you're really trying to maximize your S3 throughput, you can actually um, generate your own hashes so that you can make sure that the shards are, are balanced nice and evenly. Um, though S3 will do that for you, it just takes a little bit of time for it to catch up. But something you have to keep in mind, it's not a file system, don't think about it that way. Um, another really important thing is S3 does not have strong transactional semantics, and what I mean by that is it has eventual consistency. It is not going to work for you if you want to use it for a real-time application. Um, anything where you're, you're dealing with like transaction processing, you really don't want to do it. Um, or you have to be willing to wait, because you're not going to get real-time responses for it. It's really suited more for like analytics, like longer-term storage. So if you are um, coming from the HDFS world, I think you do have an advantage because 
you can think of S3 a lot like HDFS. The only difference is that it's just much more extreme. So the latencies are larger. Definitely the files you want to write are even larger. Um, but the bandwidth is much better. The bandwidth is essentially infinite. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can, you can, you can, we have not reached it, you can um, reach the limit of the, of the bandwidth for, say, a bucket, but you can always actually create multiple buckets if you really need to. But what you can do because of that, so the latency is longer, but it has this essentially, you know, I'll call it infinite bandwidth, so you can do parallel writes. And so you do even more batching. It's even more extreme batching than you do with HDFS. You wait even longer, and then you do even more parallel writes. Um, in Spark, you can do that um, very well by, again, what Kyle was talking about, by coalescing or partitioning the data frames. And then those were, in, it, it basically end up and become separate files, which can be written in parallel. Um, so, uh, kind of hit the this here. Um, another thing you do if you're dealing with HDFS, we deal right now, so we do have HDFS still, we do have S3. Um, we are moving more towards, we'll see if we can totally eliminate HDFS. I, th I think we probably can. But today we do do a lot of transfers from HDFS to S3. If you're doing that, then you definitely also want to make sure you optimize your reading from HDFS. And the same thing goes, really large buffers. If you're using 125 megabyte um, blocks, you want to take a look at using 120 megabyte buffers. So you can reduce basically the I.O. even just reading the data out of HDFS before you write it to S3. You definitely want retry logic. S3 writes do fail. Um, HDFS writes do fail too, obviously. I would say that we probably see more with S3. Um, so you definitely want to have retries, um, exponential backoffs, you know, those sorts of things. Depending on what client you use, some of them have them built in already. Um, the last bullet there, next to the last bullet, cannot stream to S3. You can't technically, but there are some workarounds, and I'll actually talk about it. I think the next slide we talk a little bit about that. There's something you can use called a multi-part upload, which you can kind of simulate it. But generally speaking, you should think about S3 as I have a complete file, now I'm ready to push it. Uh, tips for using S3 to HDFS, definitely use the S3A scheme. I don't think anybody would use definitely the old S3 scheme. Um, and the S3N one, it's still around, but the S3A is really stable now. Um, the last couple of releases of um, Hadoop HDFS have really improved that. Um, they have a ton of great optimizations. The biggest one is the S3A fast upload. I could, we could, you could do a whole talk about that, but essentially what it does is it mimics streaming for you. And what it will do is it'll allow you to write to it just like a stream. It'll buffer up to five megabytes or so. As long as it's five megs or more, you can actually push a part of a file to S3. And so you can simulate essentially streaming to S3 that way. We, we actually use that, it works very well for us. Um, I should actually put this one in bold and red and maybe make it flashing. Anybody remembers the flash tag in HTML? They removed that tag. So sad about that. Don't use rename or move. Uh, very bad. Great thing to do in HDFS. Um, common practice was, hey, I'm writing to a file. I don't want anybody to start reading the file before I'm done writing to it. So in HDFS, you'd write to like a temporary directory when you're done with it, close it, and then you move it. It's transactional. One um, update on the name node, and you're done. Don't do it on S3. S3, again, it's not a file system. What it essentially does is it does a copy and a delete. Um, we did that heavily, right? basically all of our writes, that's how we did it with HTTPS, because so that's the proper thing to do. And you've uh, immediately caused all of your code to run twice as slow with S3, probably even close to three times as slow, because even the, um, the delete takes a while in S3. Um, there's a ton of other advanced S3 um, techniques. If you really max out a bucket, which you can do, we have not reached that limit yet, you can get into more complicated schemes. You can do the hashing of the object names, which basically means that you're going to help it, um, S3 out a little bit, and you're going to tell it which shard to go to yourself. Um, and then you can also use multiple buckets to increase bandwidth. If you just totally max out a bucket, you can actually do the hashing. So that's it for our, our dynamic DDL uh, talk. If there's any questions, I think Chester has a microphone. So we we'll probably just do a Q&A. Do you want to just jam yeah, so we don't want to be uh, too late. So uh, hold the question to the last. So can I'll have Jill from the analytics team to talk about the analytics at GoPro. Thank you. Well, Jill set it up. 
so I just want to do a quick introduction. And Joe is uh, uh, the, the manager for the uh, analytics team. So uh, he's, he's been working on different parts of the product analytics uh, at GoPro. Recently, he's uh, concentrating on the camera analytics, so basically analyze the drones and you know, LT data. So um, uh, Joe, uh, he's a frequent speaker at uh, different conferences. And recently, he talked at the uh, uh, Polycom and other other uh, events. So, uh, <coughs> welcome. To I can speak without a mic and still my mic's on. So I brought props. I just took up my I brought props. So this is our secret backpack. Highly recommended. Coolest backpack. Just stick around. <laughs> and well, I brought this prop because. <clears throat> so this is what I'll be talking about, and I wanted to show you guys because it helps to have a visual of what is generating all the data we're analyzing. And it's important to understand the hardware and the software involved with these products. So I won't turn it on, there's no props. And here's the controller. So I'll be speaking about these two devices and how they interact and the importance of analyzing the data. <coughs> right. I'm still trying to figure out the... So while he's getting it set up, while he's getting it set up, I'll be talking about these two devices in terms of smart devices. So the analytics I show, the visual analytics, which could be applied to, let's say, smart devices where you have GPS data or altitude plus GPS data. You couldn't hear it back. No, no, can you lift it up so we won't see oh, all the oh, products? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can see. Thank you. <laughs> all right. No luck with the visuals? You can think of this in terms of smart devices, um, things you wear, but this example, since we have a drone, we have some interesting data to look at. The drone market, 3 million units this year for consumer and commercial. So that's a lot of units, that's a lot of data, trillions of events, um, petabytes of data, sensors, software, firmware data events. These sensor counts, the software, these events. So for example, I think it's uh, Airbus. 10 million, 10,000 sensors in one wing. So the number of sensors are increasing in each device. So with this increase in sensors and software, we've got massive amounts of data. I mean, drones from the 1980s and 90s, the military, there were dozens of drones being developed, all with sensor data, generating massive amounts of data. By the early 2000s, you had companies like DJI, Parrot, um, and then the consumer and then commercial started to explode with like, you got devices, automated drones performing um, aerial reconnaissance, mapping of farmland, mapping of aggregates. <clears throat> so there's lots of data being generated. And even with consumer drones, you have an incredible amount of data being generated. This puppy, when it takes off, and by the time you use up the battery and it lands, it has multi-million events that have been created. So millions of events coming off of one device after one flight, one battery charge. So it's generating a lot of data and thousands of different kinds of events and variables. So it's, it's fairly highly dimensional. It gets very complicated fast. 
And so the use case I want to talk about is kind of from the ground up. So imagine you get a request from customer service, or you have, um, in this case, I'll give this, I'll tell a story about a product engineer who came to me with a question. Hey, I was flying, and I kind of, I think I lost control too many times from the device. It was kind of glitchy. So what was going on with the, the product? Or was it the product's fault? So that's the business question. And then you want to think about, all right, what is the purpose of that? We want to look for anomalies, performance issues in the product that will actually improve product performance and thus customer experience. Or simply, we want to make a better product that, it, that performs much, much more efficient. <clears throat> all right, so in this context, it's important to think about what are the kinds of anomalies. We have your typical anomaly. It's a sensor or measurement of an event that greatly deviates from what you predict or what's kind of normal. And then we have these other two events or anomalies that are relevant to a flying device. So if a device is flying, your performance becomes important and also your environment. It's not sitting at home like an Amazon Alexa in a comfort, in a condition, air conditioned. Well, if you live in the Bay Area, you might have air conditioning, but heaters, you know, it's, so this guy is outside. It could be moist, it could be Maybe it got a little wet, maybe there's mountains, maybe there's trees. So there's environmental factors that make a difference. So your environment, where are you flying it? Also uh, measuring system errors. Maybe the sensor is measuring wrong. So you get your, it's generating bad data that you have to identify and figure out how you deal with that. Uh, innovative anomaly, um, it's interesting that you use innovative. Um, so that would be if, if you're if you're in a high wind situation and your motor is overheating or you're taking off and landing, those are sort of situations where the product's performing differently and if it's just flying and cruising. And so first, so this example, think of the context. Uh, product engineer comes to me and says, hey Jules, what's wrong? It's working, but it's not performing optimally. So what can we look at? So we want to look at the flight path, we want to look at altitude, spatial, its place, uh, and the to to topography. Where is it in space and time relative to objects like a parking garage? We have lots of fun with our concrete and steel parking garage. Lots of interference. So first, this will be interesting. So one tool I like to use is Python. And so how do I use Python plus it's pulling Google Maps and I can have my analysis in a notebook and then pulling a map, a map real quick. So GMAPS is really useful. So we want to know where's the drone flying. And by the way, this is my personal flight data. Uh, it's nearby. I guess you could probably look it up. <laughs> so, this is uh, my data. And you can do this too. If you have a Fitbit or your own drone, you can pull a longitude, latitude, plus altitude and do everything I've done here. And the code is pretty simple. You can do it, have fun playing around with it. So let's, I wanted to do a demo. Uh, we'll skip this one. So I wanted to show the Python notebook where you can zoom in and out. And so it first shows your typical map up there. And then you want to see where it is in, in the world. So maybe I don't know, this engineer, these guys get to fly all over the world testing in all these exotic places. So he could have been in Iceland. And so it's good to know was, where was he. So he was in Iceland. Uh, where was a mountain nearby? Was he flying downtown in Reykjavik or wherever? And so I want to see visually where was he flying. And the heat map helps tell you where his concentration of flying was. And the on the right side, example two is just a dot plot, a uh, line plot of just, uh, just an alternative to the heat map. And so this is one. This is your sort of, are there obvious obstructions in the environment? And next is a 3D plot. So that one was a 2D. You don't really know altitude. So a device, maybe he's flying, trying to fly 10,000 feet up, and he's losing control. And he didn't tell me that. So if I look, I can see altitude. If you guys don't mind the back to hit play. So this is in Python in a notebook. Just this much code lets you do this. And you can actually explore you could also map instead of altitude, the color is mapped to altitude. In this case, I just want to see altitude already. 
maybe went 100, less than 100 feet up. Oh, this is my data, so I only went less than 100 feet up. But you can zoom in and map the color to an event of interest. So maybe you want to map the color to an event like controller signal loss. That can be plotted and you can take a look at where in the flight path was that controller signal loss. So that becomes critical. If you know there was a building nearby, the big loop, and there was a consistent pattern of controller signal loss, then you know, okay, it's probably the building, not the product. So that's important. It's not a product issue, it's a user issue, really. Uh, just flying where the device can't handle the interference. And so that's one example where we can look at three-dimensional views of a flight path. In this case, ideally, it would be nice to have the actual map on top of this, so you can see the satellite image. Uh, that'd be a next step. But to map, um, to note, and you'll see later the example where the same flight path, we'll see errors happening on this flight path. And it becomes uh, interesting, and it helps to see it from a 360 perspective. Next is, uh, actually, this is my um, death by demo. If the demo didn't work, I was going to go to this <laughs> slide. So I got back up. All right, so the next one is 3D plus animation. If you think about it, that 3D image is helpful, but maybe it's the, the behavior of the flight, the actual progression that causes the problem. So we want to see what is the progression. If you don't mind hitting play. So we can now map in 3D space x, y, and z as altitude. We can see the flight progress. And this would all be in a Python notebook. So super fast, super easy, and it's plotly. And if you can just you can ping me if you're interested in this code, it's it's available. It's pretty easy to use. And so you can zoom in, stop it, pause it, take a look at. All right, let's say there was an event of interest right there. You can stop it and zoom in and around to see where else those events may have occurred. And so it's it's, it's fun to play with. And then next, so all right, let's look at the events that could be caused by controller signal loss. All right, so hello, let's see. So here we want to look at, all right, I'm going to map altitude plus sensor errors of interest and map it on the satellite image. So let's, it would be good to have an example of, I should have flown up by the parking garage where I get event errors um, near the parking garage, but in this case I didn't. But I would be looking for obstructions, obstacles in the flight path. If you don't mind hitting play, Let's see if this one works. So we're tracking the flight on the top, where it's flying, and we're tracking the altitude. And these are actual GPS coordinates plus the altitude variable. And so we've seen, all right, some interesting events. We got it. These aren't actual events. These are uh, simulated, but this is how they play out. So we're seeing two different errors plus signal loss, sensor error, signal loss, sensor error, signal loss. So there's a pattern. And what's interesting is this pattern has to do with that issue of when you're climbing. So it looks like their errors are occurring during the climb. And we're seeing it in real life, the real data would say this is sensor X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. and this is the type of error. So we know what the error is. And then we experience the remote signal loss. So we know that probably there's probably a correlation, and it's probably relevant. And so we would go and dig in and investigate that on this device. And so that, that's kind of the progression of a, a scenario where you have a customer service, a customer or a product engineer come to you and say, hey, I have a problem. How do I debug it? So that's, that's using Tableau plus Mapbox and using their animation. And to Dave's point of how we use Plotly and Tableau Server, so we try to automate as much as possible. Instead of um, fielding these questions one off, what we'll do is set up a, a notebook that's automated that's generating our product engineers' flights with their serial numbers so they can see them. Uh, and then Tableau, so we'll, we'll upload a workbook to Tableau Server that refreshes, sends these to wiki pages via iframes. And so this is total hands-off 
automated for somebody to select their flights and do drill downs into, into it via a notebook or, or a dashboard uh, with Tableau. And so next steps would be, all right, we experienced signal loss on an engineer's device. Is this happening across all devices sold or devices we're able to have data from? And so we're able to look at, so the next step, so you would ask that same question, do we experience signal error, the sensor error X over there? And how many devices? And what other errors do we see across devices? So you could also look at this from the anomaly detection perspective. And that, that could be my next talk, Chester. <coughs> so I would start that talk by, all right, out of all the devices I've had data on, what, what errors do I see? What types of errors? How many products? And then I can dive in and look at the different um, the flight patterns, where it was flown, um, and do other types of analysis based off of what was discovered in the anomaly detection. And so with that, Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, Paul and Dave to come back and uh, if you have any questions. <coughs> I'll raise your hand if you have questions so I can pass the mic to you. Okay. I just have a question for Jules. <laughs> can you fly this thing? I told you all the easy questions. Of course. Hi, I saw a lot of uh, Spark streaming, Spark and so on. Did you test uh, Apache Flick by the way? Well, that's, a, that's a great question. So we have, um, so we started our data platform. Um, so we started, when we started the data platform um, about two years ago, Flink, you know, it actually wasn't even an open source project. I think it was probably I can't remember, I think it was December of 2015 maybe, when they dropped like, the first version, I think the, the open source community. So um, there are three products that we narrowed it down to, it was uh, Spark Streaming, uh, Sansa, and um, I think, you know, oh, uh, Storm. So Storm, of course, was tried and true, a lot of people used it. Um, there wasn't a ton of open source development on that time. Um, Sansa was actually super cool and um, I actually knew a, a number of folks who've worked on Kafka and also worked on Samza, and I really liked it, but there just wasn't a, a ton of adoption for us. Um, really, the reason why I was Spark Streaming is several. Um, they had really strong exactly once processing guarantees, um, huge open source community, so we knew we could support. Um, at the time, we were using Cloudera, so they also provided um, a fully supported version of it. Um, and obviously, the scalability. And a real big uh, decision, a big, a big thing that kind of tipped us over to go with it was the fact that we could use Spark both for ingestion, ETL, analytics, and then even machine learning in the future. So it's like you could basically reduce your technology stack. Um, with all that said, we have looked at Flink, and actually we're very interested in it. Um, we're considering, I think at some point, my guess is we'll probably do some POCs with it. Um, Spark streaming is so wonderful, but as with everything, you know, there's lots of weaknesses. The micro-batching is very challenging. Um, we've been at it, like I said, for the better part of two years, and so we've, we've kind of moved past that, and we've kind of dealt with it, but um, you, you always have to think about the micro-batching. It's always in the back of your mind when you're designing these pipelines, because there's nothing worse, especially the way our business works. It's very cyclical. It's the cyclical during the week, the weekends, we get big spikes Saturday afternoons. Sunday mornings and afternoons, then the holiday seasons are just killer for us, which is good. We sell a lot of cameras, but they start sending us um, anonymous logs all at the same time. Like Christmas morning is ridiculous. My kids are like, oh, I always have to apologize to my wife beforehand, like, let's open Christmas presents like a couple days early, maybe. Because Christmas, and actually I shouldn't say that, we actually, this is kind of non event this past year. But um, it, it does really spike up. There's no, nothing worse than looking at your spark streaming pipeline and like, you have like 32 executors running and there's just one that's running. I should say the other 31 are just stalled and done and that's the micro-batching. So, but Flink is something we've taken a look at. And yeah. I, I want to say a few words to this. We are actually looking at uh, Flink as well. 
So, uh, so currently, do you feel the other side? So we're actually considering using the flink to monitor our service. So we have this Kafka, uh, Kafka service, so we want to monitoring. So where is the data, where is the data, which, uh, where is the stage of the data? So is it coming? So is it, in, uh, is it come to the next topic? So we kind of like want to use flink to monitoring this service. So we kind of